Hey guys, welcome back to some more OB content. My name is April and today we are going to be discussing conception. So today's discussion will be pretty quick, but I do want to walk through um, from fertilization um, all the way through some of the very important structures that we deal with in pregnancy. So of course the definition of conception is just going to be the union of a single sperm and egg, which uh, marks the beginning of pregnancy. So if we move into our second, uh, the second part of our discussion, I'm just going to walk you through some of the steps that are happening. So of course, first we have gamete formation, which is um, the ovaries are going to produce an egg. Um, uh, the male body is going to release a sperm um, into the female body. And then um, we are going to have a union of those gametes. So that is what results in our embryo. So when we talk about that egg that's released from the, um, from the ovaries, that egg is viable for about 24 hours outside of the ovary. So once it's been released, it's viable for about 24 hours. Sperm viable in the female body for about two to three days, so 48 to 72 hours. Um, once that egg and that sperm do meet, we call that fertilization, and that happens in the fallopian tube, specifically um, the outer third of the fallopian tube, which is called the ampulla. Fertilization um, or sperm can reach the egg within about five minutes, but the average time uh, that it takes sperm to reach that egg is about four to six hours. Okay, so then we have fertilization. Um, now we have a single-celled human being, which is called a zygote, but then very quickly that zygote starts to undergo cell division and, um, and then begins to travel from the fallopian tube to the uterus. That process takes about three to four days and implantation occurs six to ten days after conception. Of course, implantation is going to be in the uterus. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this cell division that's happening. So of course, the egg and the sperm meeting, we get fertilization, the zygote is the single celled human being. As soon as, that, um, as soon as that zygote undergoes a couple of rounds of cell division, we have what's called a, a marula, which is a 16 cell ball of cells. That's about three days after fertilization. And then we end up with a blastocyst, which is the whole structure of a developing embryo. And it's the blastocyst that actually implants into the uterus. So from the moment of fertilization, we have that zygote. While, it is while that fertilized egg is traveling through the fallopian tubes into the uterus, um, cell division is happening the entire way. So we start out with one cell. By the time we get to um, the uterus for implantation, we are now called a blastocyst. So the marula actually um, is going to have two parts. It's going to separate into the trophoblast and the embryoblast. The trophoblast is what gives rise to the placenta, and the embryoblast is what gives rise to the embryo. That's pretty easy to remember. And then from the embryoblast is where we get the blastocyst. So um, egg and sperm meet, we have a fertilized egg, which becomes a zygote. That zygote, uh, 16 cell divisions or di cell divisions later, a 16 celled organism is the marula. So about three days after fertilization, the marula gives rise to the trophoblast, which gives rise to the placenta or and the embryoblast, which becomes the embryo. And then the blastocyst is what we call the ball of cells that actually implants into the uterus. And this is just a visual of all of that happening. So you can see here that we have our egg that was released from our ovary. We have fertilization. Um, we have um, penetration of sperm into ovum. We get a zygote. And then look at these cell divisions that are happening. Remember the 16 cell uh, organism is called a marula, which then becomes the blastocyst. And the blastocyst continues to divide and ultimately implants in the uterus. Okay, let's talk a little bit about pregnancy. Pregnancy lasts for 40 weeks or approximately 280 days. And the length of a pregnancy is calculated from the first day of the last menstrual period. Now we do know that um, ovulation takes place roughly two weeks after 
the last menstrual period, the first day of the last menstrual period, but we do calculate pregnancy due dates from the first day of the last menstrual period. Uh, intrauterine development goes through three stages. The first one is the ovum stage, sometimes called the zygote stage. That's from the moment of conception until day 14. And what's happening in that stage is cellular replication. So all of that cell division is happening in that first 14 days. Of course, your blastocyst is forming and implanting in the uterus. You get the initial development of the embryonic membranes, and we get the establishment of primary germ layers. That's going to be the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. From those three germ layers, those three primary structures, all other structures are going to arise. So all of our organs, um, blood cells, blood vessels, bones, muscles, everything is going to come from one of those primary germ layers. Then we move into the embryo stage, which is day 15 until about eight weeks. And this, this is important. This is the most critical time for organ development. Um, all of our organ systems, our main external features are developing in this embryo stage. So this is the time when the pregnancy is most at risk um, from what we call teterogens. So teterogens can be um, harmful substances from the environment. They can be things that the mom ingests, such as harmful substances. It can even be therapeutic medications that have been prescribed to the mom, but do cause damage or could cause damage to the pregnancy. So the highest risk time is going to be the embryonic stage. By the eighth week, all of our organ systems and external structures are present. They're not 100% mature, but all of those structures are present. Then we move into the fetal stage. This is going to be from nine weeks until the pregnancy ends. And this is where those systems are going to continue to mature. The central nervous system is going to mature. Your baby is going to grow and gain weight. Here are the three primary germ layers. Again, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, and the structures that arise from each of these primary germ layers. Okay, let's talk about some important um, components of pregnancy or components of um, conception that are really vital to the survival of this pregnancy. And the first one is going to be the yolk sac. So the yolk, the yolk sac is what aids in transferring all of the nutrients from the mom and oxygen from the mom's blood until the placenta takes over. So placenta um, does not take over uh, as the endocrine, endocrine gland for the pregnancy um, and the, the organism that transfers nutrients from mom's blood supply to baby's blood supply until about 12 weeks. So the yolk sac is gonna do that job until the placenta takes over. During the fourth week, the yolk sac actually um, becomes the primitive digestive system. The embryonic membranes, that's going to be the chorion and the amnion. The chorion is the sac that covers the fetal side of the placenta. So this is where all of your major blood vessels are. Um, those blood vessels branch out over the surface of the placenta. Remember, this develops from the trophoblast. The amnion um, forms the fluid-filled sac that actually surrounds the baby, ultimately will hold amniotic fluid. Um, remember, the amnion develops from the blastocyst. Let's talk for a minute about amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid serves some really important purposes for this baby um, or this growing fetus. So initially, amniotic fluid develops by the process of diffusion from the maternal blood. So I think it's important kind of right now to establish the understanding that there is no overt mixing of blood between mom and baby. Um, the nutrients and the oxygen that come from mom's circulatory system through the placenta and ultimately to baby's um, circulatory system, all that is happening through diffusion and osmosis. So amniotic fluid initially begin, or the development, initial development of amniotic fluid begins through the process of diffusion from mom's blood. Um, then uh, that volume is gonna be maintained um, as the baby, um, uh, swallows amniotic fluid and then it flows through the GI tract and then they urinate back out into the amniotic fluid. Uh, average amniotic fluid is about 700 to 1000 milliliters at term 
and the baby we've already mentioned does swallow it. They do urinate it out. Both of those are essential features to maintain the volume of the amniotic fluid. And then amniotic fluid also flows in and out of the fetal lungs. Um, so fetal lungs are not used for gas exchange. Remember oxygen is coming from the maternal circulatory system into um, the fetal circulatory system and baby's carbon dioxide is leaving uh, baby's circulatory system back through the placenta and mom is excreting that waste. So the fetal lungs are filled with fluid. They are not used for gas exchange. Um, really important functions of amniotic fluid. They help the baby maintain a constant body temperature. Um, assist with main, the baby maintaining or the fetus maintaining fluid and electrolyte homeostasis. If mom were to fall or be in a motor vehicle accident or have some kind of traumatic injury, um, amniotic fluid does cushion the baby's vital organs from the force um, of that blow. Um, with, uh, without amniotic fluid, the baby doesn't have freedom of movement, um, and so that inhibits the development of the limbs, the musculoskeletal system. So with amniotic fluid, the baby can move their, their limbs, their arms and legs, and further develop that system. Uh, amniotic fluid provides a barrier to infection. It allows for fetal lung development. So without that fluid coating the fetal lungs, those fetal lungs don't develop. So really important. And then it also keeps the fetus from becoming tangled up in um, the umbilical cord. Okay, moving on to the umbilical cord. There are two arteries that carry blood away from the emb embryo to the chorionic villi, and there's one vein that returns blood to the embryo. So everything from mom's circulatory system is coming in through that vein, and then waste um, is leaving through those arteries back to the mom to be disposed of. Um, at term, the umbilical cord is about two centimeters in diameter and about 30 to 90 centimeters in length. And there is a substance um, inside that umbilical cord called Wharton's jelly. And that's what prevents that umbilical cord from getting smashed or crushed if the baby were to roll over on it or have it in their hand and, um, and grasp it. The placenta, we already said, is structurally complete by 12 weeks. It does grow wider until about 20 weeks, until it covers about half of the uterine surface. And then it won't necessarily get any wider, but it is gonna get thicker um, as that baby needs more and more nutrients for growth from the mom um, until term, it will get thicker. Um, I think it's really important to understand that um, the flow of nutrients and oxygen or blood flow through that placenta is completely dependent on mom's cardiac output. So if mom has anything going on in her body that is diminishing her cardiac output, you are diminishing blood flow through the placenta. And remember, that's how the baby is getting nutrients for growth and oxygen for survival. Um, as we've already mentioned, there is no direct link between the blood vessels of the fetus and the blood vessels of the mother. So no overt blood mixing. Um, those nutrients and that oxygen is being exchanged through diffusion and osmosis. However, drugs, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, all do transfer from mother's body through the placenta to the baby, as do caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, medications, carbon monoxide, all of those things cross. Um, through the placenta over to the fetal side. So those are those um, damaging substances that can harm the baby. The placenta itself does function as an endocrine gland. It produces four hormones. So remember not until week 12 is that placenta functioning. And so at around week 12, we get the placenta producing four hormones. Of course, estrogen and progesterone in large amounts are needed to support the pregnancy. But we also have that placenta producing uh, human chorionic gonadotropin and human placental lactogen. So the placenta as that endocrine gland is the lungs for the baby. So oxygen is gonna diffuse from mom's blood across the placenta into the fetal blood and carbon dioxide is gonna flow in the opposite direction. Um, the placenta is also used for storage. So carbohydrates, proteins, calcium, iron, 
all of that is um, pulled from mom's uh, circulatory system and stored in that placenta so that baby has all of the nutrients that they need, that he or she needs. Nutrition, so water, inorganic salts, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, all of those things, again, coming through the placenta into the fetal blood circulation to support that growing fetus. And then excretion. So the baby is, all the waste from the fetal body is going to cross back through that placenta over into maternal circulation and be excreted by the maternal kidneys. Okay, let's talk a little bit deeper about those four hormones. The first one is human chorionic gonadotropin. This is the very first hormone that's detected um, in pregnancy. So when you, when you do a, um, a pregnancy test, whether it's a quantitative or a qualitative, what we are detecting is HCG. Um, HCG is first detected in maternal blood around eight to 10 days after conception. Um, the purpose of HCG is to preserve the function of the corpus luteum. Um, maximum levels are, are reached at about 50 to 70 days. And then as the placenta begins to take over um, the uh, producing estrogen and progesterone, that corpus luteum is no longer needed and estrogen will um, start to decrease, I'm sorry, HCG will start to decrease. HPL is what stimulates maternal metabolism. So in pregnancy, uh, metabolism of the mother's metabolism is um, increased uh, 10 to 15%. And that is to allow an adequate supply of nutrients for the fetus. So we are gonna get increased insulin resistance in the mom so that she has more available glucose to flow over to the baby for the baby's growth and survival. Um, that increased insulin resistance will facilitate uh, glucose transport across the placenta. And HPL also stimulates breast development and that helps to prepare those breasts for lactation. Progesterone is what maintains the endometrium. Uh, so that nice fluffy soft um, layer in which the egg is implanted in the uterus. And then it also decreases contractility of the uterus. So it keeps that uterus nice and relaxed so it's not contracting. Progesterone also plays a role in stimulating maternal metabolism and also in the development of the alveoli in the breast, which are gonna be necessary for milk production. And then last, estrogen um, stimulates uterine growth. Remember that um, uterus grows from about the size of your fist when you're not pregnant, um, many, many, many times bigger than that by the time this baby is full term. So estrogen is what stimulates that uterine growth, and it also stimulates uroplacental blood flow, so making sure that an adequate amount of blood is flowing through that placenta for um, nutrient and gas exchange. Um, estrogen also causes the breast to become larger, so the breast tissue to grow, um, and it also stimulates myometrial contractility. Okay, moving on to fetal development. This is a website that I want to share with you guys. Um, it's, uh, the website is the Endowment for Human Development, and this is the link. If you click into their movie indexer, I think it's called the theater, um, you can see um, actual video from inside the uterus of developing fetuses, all the way from um, very, very early in conception, all the way to full term. So if you really want to visualize the things that are happening and, and the growth of this fetus in utero, this is an excellent website for doing that. If you're interested in a free fetal development study guide, um, please do email me. I have developed one. It goes all the way from conception to full term. Everything that is happening to the fetus or the most important things for you to know that are happening to the fetus week by week. And then I have listed also the corresponding changes that are occurring um, in, on the maternal side. So if you're interested in that free um, study guide, please email me. I'll be happy to send you a copy of it. And then I want to talk just briefly about multifetal pregnancy. So multifetal pregnancy, we tend to think of as twins. Now, certainly it could be um, triplets, quadruplets, you know, sextuplets, so on and so forth. Um, but let's specifically talk about twins for just a few minutes. So dizygotic twins are where you have two eggs and two sperms, uh, two eggs that are produced in one ovarian cycle. And of course those are um, fertilized by two separate sperm. So therefore you are getting what we call fraternal twins. Fraternal twins are no more genetically, are no more ge genetically alike than siblings. So you have two amnions those, that's, uh, and two chorions. Remember those are the 
embryonic um, layers. So you have two amnions, two chorions, and two placentas. This, these are, this is basically two pregnancies occurring at the same time. The babies can be same sex, they can be different sex, but from a genetic standpoint, no more similar than siblings. Now we can have monozygotic twins, which come from one egg. So one egg, one sperm, that egg during the process of cell division actually splits into two separate organisms. And so now these are genetically identical human beings, right? So they have to be the same sex. They're genetically identical. They have the exact same genotype. So unfortunately, there are some problems in the cell division that can occur. So if um, division occurs too soon after fertilization, then you get, or it occurs very soon after fertilization, you will get two embryos, two amnions, two chorions, and two placentas. Of course, that is your best case scenario. Now each pregnancy is supported by their own membranes and their own placentas. If cell division occurs between four and eight days after fertilization, so that's later um, in, in the process, which is actually the most common type of monozygotic twinning, you get two embryos, two amnions, two chorions, but they are both being fed by one placenta. And of course that can create some inherent circulatory problems. If division happens after day eight, which is pretty rare, but if it does happen after day eight, you can get two embryos with one amnion, one chorion, and one placenta. Now your circulatory issues are even more confounded. You can also get conjoined twins. So when cell division happens after day eight of after fertilization, that's where we see conjoined twins. And here's just a visual of the dizygotic. Remember, di means two, zygotic means zygote. So dizygotic are your fraternal twins. Whereas mono means one, so your monozygotic twins come from one egg and one sperm. So of course, we've already talked about conjoined twins. This is an incomplete cell division, usually happening somewhere around 13 to 15 days post-conception, anytime after day eight, but typically it's around day 13, day 14, and the cell division is incomplete. That's why you get conjoining. Um, triplets, of course, can either be two zygotes that divide, uh, two zygotes, one that divides into an identical set of twins, and the one zygote, which is a single fraternal sibling, or you can have three completely separate zygotes. So you can have one set of identical twins and one just fraternal triplet, or you can actually have three zygotes, which means they're all fraternal. None of them are genetically identical. Okay, so that is uh, conception in a nutshell. If you have any questions or you would like a copy of that free study guide, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, my email is listed on the screen. You can also reach out to me on Twitter. I hope that this was helpful to your study of um, fetal development. And of course, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below or feel free to reach out to me um, on social media. Have an awesome day.